So I polled for it and you guys responded. So here it is, Cohesive Friendship Unit's sixth Game of the Year awards. And for the record, none of the devs from the last five years have ever DM'd me for their awards. That's any indication of how popular these tend to be. But use the timestamps. I'm gonna be covering a lot of ground in this video and look forward to my Sekiro review. Back to our regularly scheduled programming in January, it is my biggest, most ambitious review yet. So let's get started with the Game of the Year Awards. I think I want to nominate this award to uh, my Reformed Orthodox Rabbi Bill Clinton. Thank you, everybody. Now, normally I give my favorite game that came out that year a reward, as well as my favorite game that I played overall an award, because I'm playing a lot of games, playing a lot of retro games. I might have a game that I think deserves to shine that maybe came out before this channel came out. So. This year, my favorite game overall happened to come out in 2022. So there's only gonna be one game of the year this year. And that is quite an honor, considering I played three FromSoft games this year. But with all that out of the way, my favorite game in 2022 is Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. Just kidding, it's Elden Ring. But like I said, I played Bloodborne, Elden Ring, and Sekiro this year. And while I think Sekiro has better gameplay and Bloodborne is overall a tighter experience, no game engrossed me and stole quite as many hours as Elden Ring did in 2022. Where Elden Ring lacks in pure gameplay or balance, it gets carried by art, lore, and the world that's been built. Limgrave shoots to my second favorite open world game, just behind The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. It has intelligent use of art and baking aspects of the UI into the world, like these little trails of gold for you to kind of sift your way into new areas. Uh, it helps maintain immersion for hours on end. My biggest critique of the game is its technical performance, particularly on the base Xbox One console and on PC, at least at launch. But I have a bit of a rant later in this video lamenting on the state of the industry, especially the technical state of the industry. Sadly, most games launched in a poor technical state in 2022. Now, I do want to mention I intentionally missed out on God of War Ragnarok. I have pretty big plans for a pretty big review of that game around halfway through 2023. But otherwise, I felt I was able to play any game I think would be Game of the Year contending, so I really only missed God of War this year. So check out my 30 minute review on Elden Ring for many more thoughts on the game, but I did want to give a few honorable mentions. And there's only two honorable mentions this year. The first fits as an honorable mention because it came out in late 2021 and it is a DLC. I think those two reasons pretty much disqualify it from any category that would be contending of Game of the Year. But that experience is the Outer Wilds Echoes of the Eye. Outer Wilds is one of my top favorite five games of all time, and I can't get any of my friends to play it, which really sucks because I wanna talk about how awesome it is. So I guess I'll make a video here. So maybe someone in the comments will wanna talk about it with me. Well, I can't really do that either because pretty much everything in this game is a spoiler. I do have videos on the channel about the game for more thoughts and more thoughts on the base game overall, but ultimately I can only go so far because a huge part of the game is exploration and puzzle solving. Outer Wilds has a very Breath of the Wild feeling to it. The rules of the world are defined for you in the very beginning hours and you use and abuse those rules to explore a tiny solar system. Popular joke among fellow interlopers is they wish they could have their memory erased men in black style so they could experience the game for the first time again. Echoes of the Eye is the closest thing to being able to experience that base game again. It adds about 10 hours to the 15 to 20 hour base game, introduces huge new areas and grand new ideas that go together for an entirely new story and it all seamlessly blends into the base game. And the content is generally just as good, if not better, than the core game. The key difference is most of the exploration is not interplanetary, but uh, new ideas make up for this, and you still get to 
sort of traverse worlds, if that makes any sense. If you've played Outer Wilds, I'm sure you love it and already bought this and loved it. Everyone else, just buy Outer Wilds. Trust me. And my second honorable mention is Vampire Survivor. Realistically, do I think it could win Game of the Year? No. But I wanted to give it a shout out, especially since I didn't review it. For the price of a coffee at Starbucks, you can get many hours of entertainment. There's no microtransactions, solid performance, and it's just simple, distilled fun. Vampire Survivor is extremely indie, from art style to ethos to gameplay. A roguelite with Castlevania inspirations, Vampire Survivor made me finally get passive games, what they're all about and why you might want to invest time into a quote unquote passive game. You can pretty much play this thing one-handed. The concept is very simple, and sometimes you just need to turn your brain off and cool off for a bit. This is the perfect game for that. Help me get through some difficult times, and I look forward to more content coming down the pipeline from Vampire Survivor. Speaking of difficult times, The video game industry in 2022. Games are making me very sad right now. Every single game that launched in 2022 that was kind of like a flagship title for the company or for the publisher seemed to just be a buggy, shitty mess at launch. And what many people would maybe think to be game of the year contenders in different years all just had horrible launches. These are respected franchises like Pokemon, Gotham Knights, Overwatch, Sonic Frontiers, and Saints Row, that's just to name a few. There were plenty more games that had just abysmal train wrecks of launches, and sadly, this isn't really new. This is a continuation of a trend that has just been ramping up, and I think we excused it because of the pandemic, we excused it because of new consoles, but now it's 2022. I think the excuses are pretty much uh, hard to come by at this point, and yeah, my game of the year uh, Elden Ring, I really harped on its performance. It really was very bad on the PC at launch. My understanding is it's not completely rectified, and that's kind of a shame. But besides shoddy performance, sparse content. Nintendo. Do you guys remember Nintendo in 2017? We got Breath of the Wild, we got Super Mario Odyssey, we got Snipper Clips. Well, it's 2022 now, and we got Wii Sports 2, and um, Mario Sports Golf Soccer, and that's a little disappointing. Nintendo is not the only one who's to blame here. Uh, I'm looking at Halo Infinite, this games as a service that we were promised in late 2020. Uh, it is now 2022, end of 2022. And um, we have, uh, what, two new maps in Halo, something like that? We're still playing Forge, right? Me and the boys had a great time playing the uh, co-op campaign for Halo, right? Split, split screen, split screen co-op for Halo, everybody. And yeah, I mean, Overwatch 2 is another example. It's just that games seem to be coming out at a slower clip. And when those games do come out, they seem to be kind of bare bones in content. I mean, I'm looking at you, Mario Golf, Mario Tennis, Mario Strikers, just the absolute minimum. Wii Sports 2, Golf coming in fall. It's just kind of painful to get really hyped for this package, and then it's not as good as the old one. And that just really sucks. Speaking of things that really suck, over monetization. Last of Us Part 1. Just The Last of Us. It does look good, but it's $70. The remake of The Last of Us, which adds no meaningful content, costs $10 more than the original game. Call of Duty is another great example, Activision Blizzard as a whole, and I'm not just trying to pick on a few companies. Don't worry. There are plenty of companies, throw them down in the comments that you can just rip apart for blatant over monetization, exploitation of gambling addicts, exploitation of children, just not a good look in the industry right now. And hardware, well, 
everyone was really hyped for the PS5 and the Xbox Series X and S, but here we are in 2022 and consoles are still really hard to find. Not only that, but a lot of hardware raised price. The Oculus Quest 2 went up in price. The PlayStation 5 went up in price. Xbox games, which I know is technically not hardware, but they recently announced that they're going to be raising the price. But availability is by no means guaranteed. I still cannot walk into a Best Buy or a Target or a Walmart and just see a PlayStation 5 sitting there ready to buy. Not only that, but now you have to pay more for it at a time when it's harder to pay more for things. And don't even get me started on the 4080 and other 4080, which is really just a 4070. I don't even want to talk about PC hardware right now. Very upsetting. And speaking of the Oculus Quest 2, VR is basically dead right now. What were the flagship titles for VR? What what happened to Grand Theft Auto San Andreas that was being developed for the Quest 2? What happened to all of these great games? What happened to the Assassin's Creed game, the Splinter Cell game? It's just kind of in a sad state. I'm hoping PSVR 2 can bring things back, but this seems to be a very low point for the VR space. And Kind of, last but not least, companies suck. Ubisoft has a huge harassment issue that is constantly being pushed under the rug by media and Ubisoft itself. Activision had the whole Bobby Kotick thing. There's greed from top to bottom on all these publicly traded companies and their executives. And crunch is abundant at just about every company. If you dig deep enough, you will find a crunch problem. And it is pervasive in the industry. And it all just feels so sad. I honestly feel like the industry is in the worst place it's been in my entire life. AAA games take too long to release, they play too safe, they over-monetize, and they release in a horrible state. And the barrier to entry to owning the hardware to play these games has only been on a steady increase. But all that being said, I do have a few games I'm looking forward to in 2023. And those 2023 games I am looking forward to and usually I do a separate video on this, but Game of the Year never performs well, and this video never performs well, so I'm just gonna bundle them together. Is, of course, Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Goes without saying, I have hope. I really hope it doesn't get delayed. I kinda think it's gonna get delayed. I still feel like we just don't know anything about this game. I still have reservations about the map being reused. However, Link Between Worlds, reuses the Link to the Past map, one of my favorite Zelda games, so I have a lot of hope and I do have faith in Nintendo when it comes to Zelda. Resident Evil 4 Remake, I am uh, I'm excited for the ride. Resident Evil 2 Remake was extremely good. I hold Resident Evil 4 in very high praise in my heart. You can check out my VR review of that game. So I think I'm going to be more cautious about going into this one, but I'm excited to finally see it happen. I feel like this has been rumored for 10 years at this point, and I'm ready to see what goes on. Fire Emblem Engage is the closest game. It's right around the corner. It's a month away, and I'm actually really excited to get back into Fire Emblem. I This clearly is a game that got delayed or whatever due to COVID or something, because this is definitely something that was meant for an anniversary for Fire Emblem. It's kind of a fan servicey game. However, what I've seen in terms of gameplay looks extremely promising, and I love Fire Emblem, so I'm hoping that they can reduce some of the grind that came with Three Houses and kind of streamline while keeping the things that worked in Three Houses. Pikmin 4 is something I'm super excited about. I really don't think it's going to come out in 2023. They say it's going to come out in 2023. And if that's the case, getting Fire Emblem Engage, Pikmin 4, and Zelda in the same year is a pretty impressive feat for Nintendo. And Nintendo will be kind of back on their on their hardware game. It'll be kind of a good late year for the Nintendo Switch. And I am, of course, looking forward to Starfield. As a meme, not really looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to playing it and laughing at it and laughing at it with the internet. As for a channel update, none of this is official, but I want to do more travel reviews like the Odin Light and Steam Deck review, except with games. And I want to specifically go to the place where the game takes place. Currently, I have one of those in the works, and that's Sekiro. 
I have about five that could be feasible this year, depending on how my life plays out. We'll see, but Sekiro, definitely happening in January. It's going to be a very in-depth, big review, and my FromSoft reviews tend to do well, so hopefully you guys like it. I haven't decided if I only want to do travel reviews or a mix of travel and dedicated reviews. My only concern with mixing things would be inconsistency in the channel, being that uh, I put out, you know, maybe a Fire Emblem Engage review, and then I'm obviously not going to travel to wherever the hell Fire Emblem Engage takes place. So that one would just be a, a normal review like you've seen in the past on this channel, but then maybe something like Grand Theft Auto Vice City, as an example, if I reviewed that, I would go to Miami, I guess. So I might put out some polls, and my opinions might change, but that's kind of the vibe right now. And that's Cohesive Friendship Units 2022. I think I really stepped up the quality of my work. I look forward to continuing that trend. I can finally be somewhat proud of what I'm making. And anyways, the next review is Sekiro. It is dropping in January. Thanks for watching, and I will see you then.